which are in the name of Jesus. Father in heaven, we hallow your name tonight. We give you all the honor and praise and glory that is due to your name. Father, tonight we come again to sit at your feet, dear God. We come to hear from you, dear Father. And dear God, even as your word is delivered tonight, dear God, may it go forth, dear God, in truth. And God, we know that your word is sharp and may pierce our hearts. Father, we're thankful, dear God, that we can come together like this to study your word and to know that what you are saying to us in this time. I pray, dear God, that we would be a prepared people, a prepared bride, dear Father. And in Jesus' name, dear God, I pray for your anointing, dear God, to rest heavily upon your speaker tonight, dear Father. I pray, dear God, that as we discuss, dear God, that we would edify each other, dear Father, and give you all the glory and all the praise that is due unto your name. We bless you and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Sister Carol. Hallelujah. And thank you to Sister for that opening prayer. Yeah. And I yeah. want to say good evening to my brothers and sisters from the Church of God Reformation Movement in Barbados and across the region. And also to my brothers and sisters from other denominations that are joining us for our Bible study sessions. We are glad to have you. We appreciate that you're joining with us as we study the word together in search for the truth of what God is saying to us through his word. Last week, we started to look at the rapture doctrine and we were examining through the eyes of the premillennialists because we say that that um, particular perspective is the one that is most common among um, our churches. And so we were examining based on script references that they use to support um, their particular position. We look at the passage from Matthew chapter 24. And tonight we're going to look at another passage from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, because that's another one of the key passages that they use support the concept of the rapture. We, we examine certain perspectives that are associated with their doctrinal position on the rapture because there are certain tenets that they have that are associated with their particular teaching. And so I recognize that it was important to list them so you understand um, what are associated ideas or theological positions in relation to how they view the rapture. So after we examine 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 tonight, a passage from there, which is another key reference of theirs, what we would do is to look at some other passages in the Bible which offer a different perspective and to examine them in the light of what they have been suggested, suggesting is their position to see if we can accept what their position is, or it can be refuted based on what we are examining um, from other passages of scripture, mainly in the New Testament. Because one of the principles we identified is that we, we start from what is clear, simple instruction, and let that help us interpret other passages that might be figurative and might be a little more difficult to interpret. So in other words, and this is perhaps um, a very important one, if the, if the plain saints meet saints, seek no other saints. And interestingly enough, that is, that is one of the principles that were identified by the premillennialists in terms of, of studying and interpreting the word. If the plain saints meet saints, seek no other saints. And, and sometimes we, we, we have the plain saints, but we bypass it to interpret a, a different perspective because we want to defend um, a theology that has been brought to us. So we were examining some relatively clear, simple passages coming from Jesus himself, uh, from Peter, and uh, from John. And we would examine those passages in light of the suggestions that accompany the theology of the Millennials in relation to the rapture. So first, let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 
I read it from verse 13 to verse 18. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even to them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. All right, so we see from, from that context, the idea of the catching up of the saints to meet the Lord in the air. And this, we say, is where the concept of the rapture comes from. So even though the word is not used in, in, in the context, we say that the, the English word that we use is derived from the Latin, which means to, to, to catch up or to snatch away. And that's the concept of, of the rapture. So that's why I established last week that all three of the different perspectives, that is the post millennialist the pre millennialist and the amillennialist would believe in a catching away of the saints from the earth to meet the Lord, which we call the rapture. So technically speaking, we all support the concept of a rapture of Christians being resurrected and Christians being caught up to meet the Lord. Now where the, the main difference comes is in the timing of the event and what happens after the event. So we're going to examine this again in the context of the passage, which is one of the principles that we identified. You must examine what the word is saying in the context of, of what it, it is saying. So the Apostle Paul is writing to the Christians at Thessalonica because they are concerned with the fact that Christians are dying and Christ has not yet returned. Remember Jesus told the disciples that as he was going, they will see him coming back in like manner. So the, the thought was among the, the early Christians is that Christ would return in their generation, in their lifetime. So I guess there would have been a major concern when Christians would have recognized that some of their brothers and sisters are dying and yet Christ had not returned. And they were wondering about what was going to happen to them. That was a concern. So Paul is assuring them you need not worry about the Christians who are asleep. That's the term he used, asleep in, in Jesus. He says, because when Christ comes, we are not going to go ahead and leave them. That's, that's what is the meaning of the word prevent. Prevent does not mean get in the way. But he says that we shall not prevent them which are asleep. Which means that we shall not go before. We shall not go ahead and leave them. What, what would happen is that the dead in Christ will rise first. So this is, 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 is not a, a timing of a first resurrection and a second resurrection. This is just the order in which the, the ending would occur. Is that before the Christians are caught up to meet the Lord, the ones who were asleep or who were dead in Christ, they will be resurrected first to join the ones who are alive, and then we'll be transported together to meet the Lord in the air. So that's the, the, the context in which Paul is, is explaining um, that, that concept of being caught up to meet the Lord. So we, we see here that there is no context of a secrecy either because the premillennialists believe in a secret rapture. That's how they interpret the statement that Jesus made that his coming will be like a thief in the night, which we will see has been alluded to by Apostle Paul and has also been alluded to by Peter, because obviously they will be taking their understanding from the, the instruction and the teaching 
that Jesus would have given. So you will see that both Paul and Peter made the same reference to the coming of the Lord as like a thief in the night. But what we see here in the context is an indication that there can't be anything secret about this because it says the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. That sounds like a lot of noise to me. So this would eliminate the whole concept of, of, of secrecy. Then we also have to look at some words that are used in the Greek. Now, this is one of the principles that we have to bear in mind. I don't think I mentioned it the first time when we were looking at the foundational principles, but it is important if we can get the original words that are used, either Hebrew or Greek, depending on which context we're using. If it's Old Testament, we'll be dealing with Hebrew. If it's New Testament, we'll be dealing with Greek. So if we can get the original words that are used at times, it, it gives us a better understanding. And this is why it's good that uh, as a principle, where we can get original words used, it will help us in our understanding of what is being said in, in, the, in the particular reference. So for the word coming, this is in verse 15, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. And, and the Greek word used there is parousia, that is spelled P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A. And that means that is making reference to a bodily presence. That's what it means in the Greek. It's, it's coming to a particular place or arriving at a particular place in, in bodily form. So the idea that the, the idea that the premillennials put forward in that, that Christ will come in the air secretly, he will not be seen, he will just appear. That does not match the, the context of the word that is used um, in the Greek. Parousia, which means a body appearance. And then where Paul mentions that we will caught up to meet the Lord in the air, the Greek word used there is apentesis. That is spelled A-P-N-T-E-S-I-S. -E and it means to gather for a reception for visiting dignitaries. And we were explaining last week, that is a, that is a suggestion that you are going to be meeting a person in a bodily form. And the, the idea also is conveyed that you meet that person, you go out to meet the person, and then you return with the person to the place that they're arriving at. So this is suggesting to me that our meeting in the air with the Lord, we accompany him back to the earth. Because our understanding is that when Christ comes back, it brings an end to all things. So this is not a catch in the way of the saints taking them to heaven for seven years where they will have the marriage supper of the Lamb. But this is a, it's a meeting which brings a climax, an end to all of the earth's activities. And Christ is coming for final judgment, final reward and punishment, and the establishment of his eternal kingdom where we will be with him forever in eternity. Now, as I said, one of the, the issues that have been raised is whether we, we go to the place that Christ said he has gone to prepare a place for us, or if we remain with him on the earth restored or renewed. That is a, a discussion and a dialogue which theologians have been engaged in as well. And we will take a little opportunity to look at that later down. That is not going to form the main part of our dialogue now. Suffice it to say, the position of the amillennialists, and that's the position which the Church of God um, theologians support, is that Christ's coming brings an end to things. So there's no rapture of taking us away from a seven-year tribulation which will go on on the earth, and then Christ returns after that. So... I hope you have your Bibles with you because we're going to be looking at a number of references now to examine what I suggested to you last week are some of the things that accompany the pre-tribulation rapture perspective, which is put forward by the premillennialists. One, for them, time does not end when what Paul just described occurs. 
for them, that is the rapture that takes place and move Christians away from the rapture that takes place. Paul's suggestion to us does not give us that indication that that's what they believe. And then they read a, a verse in, in the book of Jude. Jude only has one chapter. So there's a verse in there that says that Christ returns with ten thousands of his saints. So for them, those saints that are mentioned in Jude returning are the saints that have been raptured and now coming back to the earth with Christ. And we are going to examine that in the light of what the word is saying and some other passages which you will look at uh, this evening. So bear in mind that their concept suggests then that there's going to be more than one resurrection because a resurrection will take place in relation to the text that we just read. That would be their first resurrection. Then another resurrection will take place after the tribulation because Christians that accepted Christ in the tribulation, some of them would be martyred, so they would die. And if Christ is coming back to set up a millennial kingdom, they will have to be resurrected to go into that kingdom with the Christians that are still alive. That would necessitate a second resurrection. And then there will have to be a third resurrection because when you go into the millennial kingdom, remember as I indicated previously, some of the people going into that millennial kingdom, according to their theology, would have to be people that were not resurrected. So they will still be in their mortal bodies. So it means that they will die in that thousand year period, unless they're going to live for the full thousand years. They would see death, which means then that there will have to be another resurrection after the millennium. And then, according to their teaching, the, the unsaved that have remained in the grave. Because remember, when their so-called rapture takes place, it's only Christians that are resurrected. Now, we agree with that. Only Christians are resurrected in the first instance. But we will look and see what the, the scriptures that are identified in the other part of the New Testament, what they indicate will happen at the end. Because our indication is that there's going to be a general resurrection. So what Paul was describing there is just the fact that dead Christians will be resurrected before the living ones are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. But that's not the only form of resurrection that will occur, as we will see in, in the passage that we will examine. So we are going to pick up from St. John, chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. Jesus is speaking. He says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. Watch, watch the context here very carefully. The hour, this is a specific time period, is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto eat unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Now the premillennialists split that into two different resurrections. So they're saying the first one is what Paul was referring to in the passage that we just read, 1 Thessalonians. And then the second one, which would have the resurrection for the unsaved, which is the resurrection of damnation, that will take place at the great white throne judgment, which will happen after the millennium, at the end of everything. So they split these resurrections into two. Now, from what the word is saying here, is, it indicates to me, well, of course, when you get a chance to ask some questions, you will um, give your suggestions. But what I see here from the plain context of the word is that there is going to be a resurrection. That's what the, the word says. For the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. All, all meaning both the Christian and the non-Christian. Because the text goes on to explain that they that have done good, the Christian, unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil, unto the resurrection of damnation. 
and all of them come up at the resurrection at the last day. All right, so we move on to another passage. Still in John, chapter 6, verse 39 to 40. I'll pause a little bit so if you have fraternity references that you can you can get there. Jesus is speaking again. It's clear text. It is simple text. And there's no there's not figurative language used here or symbolism. It's clear text. So we are using these clear texts to help us to get meaning as to what the word of God is teaching us. John 6, 39 and 40. And this is the Father's will, which have sent me, that all which he have given me, I shall lose nothing, but shall raise it up at the last day. Watch that carefully. I don't know if you're going to get any time after the last day. For me, the last day is the last day. And what Jesus is saying here is that the resurrection takes place at the last day. So this refutes the particular perspective that the millennials, the premillennialists have. Because what they're saying is that there's going to be a first resurrection, which only takes Christians away. Time goes on. So that is not the last day. Time goes on. There is a great tribulation. People die. People were resurrected. There is a millennium literally established on earth for a thousand years in which Christ will reign. And then there's going to be a final resurrection and judgment which will take place, which they call the great white throne judgment. Uh-huh. Jesus is saying here, here so, so the, the, what I'm saying in the context there, Jesus is saying that the resurrection takes place at the last day. So which means that time cannot continue after the resurrection as the premillennialists are suggesting. They are, they are indicating that the rapture takes place and time goes on. Jesus is saying from this passage, that's my understanding of it. So as I said, when we get to the, the part where we are, are discussing and we're asking questions, you can tell me if you agree with that statement or if you have a question or issue with it. But the last day is the last day. And there cannot be time after the last day. And Jesus is saying that the resurrection takes place at the last day. There's a passage in John chapter 11, um, 23 and 24. This is in, in relation to the, to the, the Lazarus resurrection. And um, remember, the sisters were concerned that, that Jesus was not there and their brother had died. But when Jesus came on the scene, he says unto Martha, thy brother shall rise again. Martha says unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. No, no, this is this is this is Martha speaking. So you've got to wonder now where does she get that theology? Obviously, she was spent some time around Jesus, and he did not correct her and say, well, no, Martha, you have the wrong theology. The resurrection is not going to take place at the last day. So his references indicate that the resurrection takes place at the last day, and the statement that Martha would have made is an indication that she would have had some of the teaching from Jesus in relation to the resurrection, that she could say, I know, I know that's an assurance that he shall rise again in the resurrection. So she's assured that a resurrection will take place. And the indication from what she said in her statement is that the the resurrection takes place at the last day. Okay? Now we're going to go to another passage. This is one from Paul. And I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians 15, 22, 26. Incidentally, this is another passage that the criminalists use to support um, their belief system in the pre-tribulation rapture and time continuing. But as we look at the passage very carefully, you will see it give a different indication 
and what their presupposition is. First Corinthians 15, 22 to 26. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. And incidentally, again, the, the word chosen there is the Greek word parousia, referring to his coming, his bodily presence, his arrival. And it goes on, then cometh the end. Then he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. When he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So Christ returns to bring an end. When he was resurrected, he said, all authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. He is returning now to claim all authority and bring an end to all kingdoms, all powers, all rulers. And he's going to put everything under his feet. He is going to take full control. And Paul says that the order is that Christ would have been the first fruit of the resurrection. He was the first to come back on his own from the grave. Of course, of course, Jesus um, resurrected Lazarus. But Christ is the first that would be able to come back on his own from the grave. So he's the first fruit in, in that sense. And it goes on to say, afterward, they are Christ. So Christ led the way by coming back from the grave on his own authority and power. And at his coming, he's going to bring back those that are his, referring to the Christians. And it goes on immediately after to say, then cometh the end. Then he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. <clears throat> when he shall put, have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies on his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Which means, if that's the last enemy to be destroyed, and it is destroyed at Christ's coming, how then can death still continue after Christ comes? <clears throat> Because according to the rapture theory, life continues. And if life continues, death continues because people will die in the tribulation and people will die in the millennium. So how could it that Christ comes back and, and brings an end to the, the last enemy, which is death, and death still continues in the presence of Christ? That, to me, is a contradiction. And, and, and therefore, to, to support that particular position, to me, <clears throat> is just to defend a particular doctrine which you have traditionally accepted, but you are disregarding um, an important revelation coming from the same word in simple, clear, plain language, which gives a, 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 a contradictory position and which refutes the position that you have. So this is why, as a, a millennial supporter, I, I would not be inclined to agree with the interpretation given by the premillennialists. Now I'm going to turn to another passage, and this is by Peter. And then we will take a, a break. Second Peter chapter 3. I'll read from verse 10. <clears throat> Pardon me clearing my throat a little bit. It was just itching me a little bit. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. See, Peter is using the same analogy as Jesus. Jesus makes that um, sort of comparison in the Matthew chapter 24 passage, which we will have to continue. Because remember, we just put that part of that passage, but in the, in the session to come, you're going to look at the full passage in Matthew chapter 24 because 
this is where the Philippians get the concept of the tribulation from. So their reading into that passage makes them believe that there's a tribulation that's going to come after the rapture. So we will examine that very carefully to see if that is what the word suggests. <clears throat> so Peter using the same um, sort of comparison that Paul used and that Jesus used. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And the day of the Lord is an Old Testament reference used to indicate the final day, which is the day of judgment. And very often, if you read the Old Testament, you will see reference being made to the day of the Lord as the day of judgment, the final day. So he says, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. Day of the Lord, which is the final day. And again, what is secret about this? The heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. That's the day of the Lord that is coming like a thief in the night. So the concept of the teeth in the night, which the premillennialists use to support a secret rapture, that's where the movie is based on, teeth in the night. And, and their belief is that this concept of the teeth in the night is, is the secret coming of the Lord in, in the rapture. Peter's analysis here does not agree with that. His use of the teeth in the night illustration is an illustration that suggests that everything comes to an end. The heaven shall pass away with a great noise. I can't see any super saying that. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. This, this is an end of events to me. This is an end of the world. And according to Peter, this is the day of the Lord which comes as a thief in the night. This is not a secret rapture at all. So the reference then to the thief in the night cannot be applied to a secret rapture, not in the light of what Peter is teaching us here. He says, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and holiness, looking for and hasten unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So the question is that we will ask the this: where are you going to be living if time does not end when Christ returns? Where is your millennium going to take place if what Peter is saying is true? Because according to what Peter is saying, that thief in the night coming is the final day of the Lord and it brings an end to all things. Earth is dissolved. The elements shall met with fervent heat. So where are we going to be staying for a millennium? Where is the tribulation going to be taking place and people still on the earth? He said, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth. All right, that is introducing the idea that I said that we have to dialogue about because of the debate on, on that as to where we spend eternity. Peter says, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, making reference to Jesus' promise, look for new heavens and a new earth where in dwell of righteousness. But you, I just leave that there hanging, just teasing you with that. But we're not going to, to discuss that in any detail now. But, but, but pay attention to that. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot, and blameless. Again, as I indicated, when reference is made to the coming of Christ, there's always statements given to how we ought to prepare. That's why I tell eschatology is important because it, it makes us focus on the coming of the Lord, but it also um, warns us about being prepared. We have to examine the way we live our lives. Okay, so I hold there for a break, for any questions, any comments.
Any disagreements? Sure. I want to hear them. And uh, please talk to me. Don't be afraid. Your questions are important. And your belief or your interpretation is important. Share that with us. And we can dialogue about it in relation to these passages I've shared with you. Reverend Jamal, Pastor John here. Yes, sir. I thought you would have drawn on Acts 24 and 15 um, in support of your presentation. Yes. When it states that there is only a resurrection, there's one single resurrection that the coming. Right. Yes. And I think, I, I think that they have, the premillennialists and the postmillennialists have a, a hard time um, giving any person who seriously studies the word evidence of mm. the, any of the two positions. None of the two positions really hold water with any person who does a full study of the word. Because you, you're spoken about Paul, you're spoken about Peter, you're spoken about John. John, yeah. But now you're speaking about, <clears throat> excuse me, Luke, mm. whose whole emphasis was to give an accurate historical record of Jesus Christ to Theophilus in both his letters, in both his treaties. And so, and so Luke makes it absolutely clear that there's going to be a resurrection, just one. Yeah. So I just thought I would include that. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that very much. And that that's a significant point. You 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 don't see two phases to Christ coming. Whenever you see Christ coming, you see singular. And when you see resurrection, a resurrection, singular. So so they are superimposing their their theological position on the word. And that is not proper um, hermeneutics. You, you, you are not supposed to superimpose your position and then try to make the word agree. Now, now John, you said there, there shall be a resurrection of which Jesus says. And he said a resurrection of the just and a resurrection of the unjust. But they split that into two different resurrections. <clears throat> all, all Jesus was saying is that there's going to be one resurrection with two groups coming up in that resurrection. First, the Christians and then the unsaved. But again, their human hermeneutics say to them that they will split that in two. In, in other words, two different resurrections at two different times. So the Christians do not come up the same time as the unsaved. The Christians come up before in the rapture and the unsaved come up way down in time. That's their that's their position. But as you rightfully said, you know, it can't match the word. And that's what we're looking at. The word. What does the word say? All right. So I appreciate that. That's that. Coming, Brother John. Uh, good evening, Reverend Jackman. Yes, good evening. Um, I don't have a, a question per se, but it's a follow-up on um something that you've asked last week. Yeah. Um, about the people who are living or occupying um. The land of Israel now. Yeah. Yeah, you're asked if they are the original Jews of the Bible. Yeah. I was waiting to see if anybody, if they hear from anybody, would have come up with an answer, but apparently no one did. But um, I do not think they are the descendants of the original Jews of the Bible. I don't think so. Okay. Um, a noted and distinguished Jewish historian, Arthur Kessler, wrote a book called The Thirteenth Tribe. Arthur Kessler grew up believing that he was a Jew. He was of a Polish descent. But he was a little skeptical about it. And it led him to do some research. And he came up with this book the 13th tribe, and he is saying that if the people who live there now are Jews, they will have to be a 13th tribe. Now, um, Time Magazine of September 26, 1955, featured on its cover, Gamal Abdel Nasser, president of Egypt. He is quoted as saying, 
there will never be peace in Israel because they left as blacks and returned as whites. And we have evidence in the Bible to support these findings. I mean, there's so, there's so many scriptures that we can read to support these findings. Just look at um, in, in Revelation chapter 2, 9. It said, I know your affliction and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, mm -hmm. but are a synagogue of Satan. That's what John, John writing to the church at Smyrnoff, telling them, saying that we know, we know that they are a synagogue of Satan. They're not Jews who occupy any land. All right, all right. I, I wanted to hold on that one because, as I say, that, that is a topic which I hope we can get to because that is something very, very, very much connected to end-time events because you hear a lot uh, among the evangelical American Christians about support for Israel and that we need to be on the side of Israel because they are the people of God. And I'm talking about Israel as a state because of their Israel. And as I indicated to you, that, that, that has been a topic that has come into recent discussion and research. I am familiar with, with the, the, the 13th trade that you're talking about. I have read some of the research and I have been doing, you know, some a lot of research on my own in relation to that, that whole area. And, and yes, you, you, you are right to indicate that there is support um, in the Bible for a different perspective on it. But it's a heavy topic, so I, I just want to hold you on that one. I put it as a teaser. And you introducing some, some very important elements here. Because uh, Paul even mentioned about those who say they're Jews and are not really Jews. But we will want to hold that. And I hope we will get some time to be able to look at it. Because there has been a lot of recent research going into it. And a lot of discussion. And, and there are, again, views on it that will, will vary. But evidence is evidence. And you can't refute hard evidence if you have the evidence. And if we can find biblical support for a position, that's what we have to go by. But that is going to be an interesting dialogue. And I, I'm glad that at least they have one person who is picking it up because I think that that should be for some interesting dialogue when we come to that particular um, discussion. All right? So just, just hold that because it will go too deep and we don't want to divert from the trend we are on. But, but thank you for that, that thought that you put in there. Okay, thank you. Yes. All right, if there are no more questions, we can proceed a little further. All right, so keep keep on track what we're trying to do. We are examining the rapture based on the perspectives that gains the most popular so support. Because it indicated you from the very beginning, about 70% of evangelical believers have come along with the tradition of premillennialism because it was taught in Bible schools, it was taught across um, the, the, the nations, and you had very um, eminent, well-known, and strong Bible theologians that support that view, and so it became a dominant view. And because it is dominant, it does not necessarily mean it is right. So we are examining um, the whole end of, end, end of time events in relation to the views which they project, saying that they're most popular. And we are trying to find um, evidence from what the Bible is indicating to us that goes contrary to what they might be suggesting. So because we are looking for the truth. So we've just looked at some statements that were made by um, some of, of the disciples. And there are clear passages. They are not passages like the ones we will see in Revelation when we get there that will call for a lot of interpretation because it's heavy symbolic language, a lot of figurative language and poetic language. These are clear prose, simple, straightforward. And to me, I don't know if they are to you, but Brother John agreed with the fact 
that he would see one resurrection as indicated in the Bible. And, and that's my understanding. I've been reading um, the theology of, of the premillennialists from, from almost a generation ago. And I've read a lot of their literature. And I have come to the conclusion that a lot of what they project is their own ideas superimposed on the world because it's a, a tradition that was well established. Um, and more often than not, theologians come along defending that tradition. But when you look at the word, you see something completely different. Another verse in Peter here, which I, would, I want to read before I look at some parables that Jesus gave to us. Simple, clear parables again, which suggests something completely different. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 7. It said, but the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The earth, which now is, is, is reserved, waiting until that day, which he described, the day of the Lord, is the Old Testament way of expressing the day of judgment. Peter picks it up. I remember we said, as one of the principles, watch how New Testament writers interpret Old Testament saints. Watch how New Testament writers interpret Old Testament examples. Because their theology is the theology which would have been taught to them by Christ. And, and they are, are men that are spirit-led and spirit-directed. And therefore, we cannot dismiss their interpretations in preference to modern day theologians who very often have a position to defame rather than trying to look at precisely what the word of God is saying. And we try as much as possible to do that. And I am encouraging us as, as Bible students to do that. Even with our own views, we examine our views in the light of the word. Not because, hey, we are amillennialists or we got for amillennialism. No, I'm saying we are amillennialists because we believe that that's what the word is supporting. And if you see any particular reason justifiable from the word, which brings a different position, you have the right to, to refute it and, and object to it based on the, the evidence that we have in the word. So we, we look not to defend a theology, we look to defend the word, because that's what the Bible tells us. We must, we must um, defend the faith, which has been handed down to us from Christ and from his uh, apostles. Okay, so we, we, we are going to look at some passages now from Matthew. Matthew chapter 13, and these are giving us some parables that Jesus used as illustrations. And these parables again also speak of the end time. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 13, and we're going to look at verse from verse 38 to 43. Now, this is in reference to the, the parable of the sower that Jesus would have given. And he's now giving the explanation. So Jesus gave a parable, and he's giving the explanation to the parable. So again, this is Jesus giving an interpretation to what he gave to his listeners in a parable. All right, let's pick up from verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. His disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tears and the wheat. See, very often when the disciples don't have a clear understanding, they would take Jesus aside. That's what they did in Matthew chapter 24. They took him aside privately and asked him to, to tell them when the temple was going to be destroyed and when his coming was going to take place. All right? He gave them a parable here and took him aside. Well, he took them aside. Um, and he's going to explain the parable to them. So verse 37 says, He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, 
and the tears are the children of the wicked one. That's very clear, very precise. And remember, Jesus is giving the interpretation. You have to take Jesus at his word. You can't add to this or subtract from it. You have to take precisely what he says. The enemy that sold them is the devil. Watch this carefully. The harvest is the end of the world. The harvest is the end of the world. What happens at the end of the world? The reapers are the angels. As therefore the tears are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that are feigned, and them which do iniquity. Watch it. He is gathering from out of his kingdom. Pay attention to that, because this is part of the study that we have to go into as well. The kingdom of God, what does it mean? For the premillennialists, the kingdom is a future coming. The physical kingdom has to be established, and that's where they bring in the millennium. So Jesus didn't establish a physical kingdom. Jesus says he will gather from out of his kingdom all things that are feigned, and then which to iniquity. So there is a kingdom before the millennial kingdom. He is gathering from out of his kingdom. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom. This is the eternal kingdom now of their father who have ears to hear, let him hear. So we see some specifics there identified by Jesus in relation to end times that will refute the position that has been adopted by the premillennial tradition. The harvest is the end of the world. Again, from this, there are two classes of people being judged at the same time. There is no separation of a judgment for the righteous at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then another great white show judgment for the unsaved. That is not the indication here from Jesus. Both people are going to receive their sentence or the, or the reward at the same time, which is at the end of the world. The tears are going to be separated from the wheat. I remember an, an early reference, it says, let them grow together. Let them continue to be together until the time of the end, because that's when the separation will take place at the end of the world. Jesus makes it clear here again, the harvest is the end of the world. I'm trying to be very precise and to be very definitive and to be very clear so you understand precisely the point I'm trying to make based on what the word is saying. That's how I base my theology. What the word is saying, not what a majority of people might have as their belief system and what their particular interpretation might be. Because Jesus here gives us the interpretation. We don't need another interpretation. Jesus makes it very clear that the harvest is the end of the world. The tears are those people who belong to the kingdom of darkness or belong to Satan. The wheat are those who are the children of the light or the children of Christ. So the tear, the, 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 the children of, of the evil one will be cast into the furnace of fire and they'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's the final punishment and sentence. And it says, and then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. So my interpretation of this, you can tell me if you have a different interpretation. My interpretation and my understanding of this text is, is very, very clear. That the end of the world is when the separation of sinner and Christian takes place. Sheep from the goat, as Jesus would have indicated, in the other reference in Matthew chapter 25. And he makes a clear indication that that takes place at the end of the world. And again, notice that there are both groups of persons involved in this end of the world experience. Christian and the unsaved. Uh, Reverend Jumpman, 
Yes. You have a question here from um, Richard? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good, uh, good night. Good night to you. Uh, Paul James, how do um, Revelation 16, 16, tie back in with this? Or this is a different concept? And he gathered them together into a place called a Hebrew town, Armageddon. So you 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 going on to something different here now, which we will get to. This is the concept of the Battle of Armageddon. So that, that has nothing to do with what we are discussing right now in terms of what happens at the end, what happens at Christ's coming. Okay. This is this, this this is what people are referring to as the as a as the battle of Armageddon, which which they will believe takes place at a certain point in time. And, and their point in time will have to be after the rapture takes place. And, and, I, and I indicated previously that that rapture position does not hold in terms of Christ coming and taking away Christians and time goes on. That's why I'm trying to show you references where the indication from the disciples, from Jesus himself, from the apostle Paul, is that the end comes. I just read a passage from Corinthians which says that when Christ returns, he brings an end. Now, if, if you want to split Christ coming into two phases, right, again, you have to find biblical support for that. But we do not find any, any of the teachers. Jesus himself never thought about his coming in two phases. And, and, and nothing that Peter says, nothing that John says, nothing that Paul says indicates a two-phase to the coming. You see, you've got all these other theological perspectives being introduced once you divide Christ coming into two phases. You're going to have got a great tribulation. You're going to have got the Antichrist. You're going to have got the Battle of Armageddon. You're going to have a millennium. You see, all that is the theology built in to the premillennial position. You see, so you have to look at these, these elements and see how they match with the whole. You see, the, the Bible tells a story. It's not disjointed. It's very, very much connected. 40 different writers writing at several different um, ages apart from different occupations and at different uh, places in life, but they bring together in a harmony a story which is cohesive, which is coherent, which 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 fits into a, a particular pattern. So we've got to watch how we try to split it up and disconnect it. We have to be careful of that. So we, we're looking at, at what pattern is very revealed to us. So Richard, I want to connect Revelation 16, 16 to what we are, are discussing. That is it's part of the concept introduced by the Millennials, and we will look at that to see if there's a literal battle of Armageddon, because remember, we are pulling that from a very symbolic book, very, very symbolic book, and we have to look and see what is literal, what is figurative, and what we can accept as the truth that is told by the whole story, because we, we, must, we must check scripture upon scripture, and we must try then to bring um, a cohesive relationship in what is projected throughout the teaching of, of Jesus and his disciples and make sure that that matches the truth of, of the word. So we will, we will have to put a hold on that because we will talk about this concept of Armageddon, where it came from and what is the teaching on it. Okay, but I, I thought that this and this ties into the defeat when you mentioned that um, as it, as it is going to aim and aim when you here with on Benjiba explaining to the disciples. Yeah, so so your your aim is is the Armageddon. I'm trying I'm trying to tell you yes, if it, if it is that if it's something, something like that. So 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 what means then if you support that position, you are you are bringing Jesus back to fight. Because because Armageddon, according to their teaching, involved Jesus fighting. They destroy the nations that have come against Jerusalem. So you're bringing back Jesus who said, my kingdom is not of this world. Because if my kingdom is of this world, then would my people fight? So Peter, you cut off the man's ear, but my kingdom is not a kingdom like that. So you, you put up your sword. So again, if the Bible tells a story, you're, you're bringing Jesus back who said that to Peter. 
and bring him back now to fight in, in, a, in a battle, a literal battle, because that's what Armageddon is suggesting. People meeting in a, in a valley to fight with swords and, and, and guns and, and all of that. And, and Jesus is in, involved in that. So again, is that is that the picture that we get from the teaching in the word? So that I'm saying, put a hole on that because what Peter is saying is not Armageddon. Peter said, "The earth shall be destroyed; it shall be met; it shall be met with fervent heat. The elements and the works therein shall be dissolved." And he said, "Is reserved by the word, and be brought to an end by the word." So I will I will put a hole on that until we get to Armageddon. Because we, we're going in sequence. The next thing we will pick up is the, is the concept of the tribulation. And we will look at Matthew chapter 24 in more detail. And then we will look at, at the Antichrist. And we look at the whole concept of the Armageddon and the millennium. And we also have to get an understanding of, of what the kingdom of God represents, what it means. I see this is where we have to go to three months. And then, as I say, if we have time, we can look at this whole concept of the Jew. The Jew in Israel now is, is that the original Jew? And, and are the promises and the things that were made in the Bible just waiting to be still fulfilled in that Jewish nation? Or have they been fulfilled in the, the Israel of, of, of Christ, which became the church? All right, because that again. Is, is a theological debate which we will want to examine to get some truth on. All right, so I pause from, from that and we move on. Another question, if anybody has another question, or we can look at another passage. Just an observation, Reverend Jamin. Yes. Um, somebody had raised the question earlier about, when you were talking about Matthew, about the separation, when they said that they believe that Christians should be taken away and the sinners will be left. Remember that? Yes, yes, yes. Right, well, well, here, here in my view, that isn't the, the picture you get. The picture you get is that the sins are taken away and the Christians are there. Right. That, that, <laughs> that is why, that's why Jesus used the analogy, John. I, I made mention of that last week. Right. That, that's, that's why Jesus used the analogy with no. Because the ones who were taken were taken to judgment. You see, people look at taken as taken in a rapture, but taken could also mean taken in a judgment. You are separate and taken away, but taken away in a judgment. So it, it, it taken there can refer to the unsaved and not the saved that are taken away. Rightfully so. All right, we look at another passage in Matthew. This is again Jesus speaking, seeing Matthew chapter 13, um, dealing with the parables. Sorry, we had a little off screen there. Pick up from verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. Watch that very carefully again. Two together and the separation is made. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just. Separation will be made. You're taking one from the other, not taking one away, but separating them. Not taking one away in a rapture. It is going to be taking place at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and shall sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing 
and gnashing of teeth. Again, this is another illustration given by Jesus. So you got the parable of the, of the tears and the wheat. Have the parable of the net. You have everybody being part of the net. They're all there together. The good fish and the bad fish in the net. And then there's going to be separation. And it's a comparison. So shall it be at the end of the world. So the tears and the wheat was used as an illustration. And the parable of the net is also used as an illustration. And I watch the comments again. So shall it be at the end. At the end. You can't get anything after the end. And according to Jesus' teaching, at the end is when the separation takes place. At the end is when you get the resurrection, according to Paul. When the last trump sounds, the mortal shall put on immortality. We shall all be changed in a moment and a twinkling of an eye. We shall all be changed. So, so immortality is not only for the unsaved, but for the saved folks. Immortality is also for the saved. The mortal shall put on immortality. Because for you to remain in the eternal punishment, you've got to be immortal. And all of this takes place at the end of the world. That's my clear understanding. I don't see how you can interpret anything different from this based on what Jesus taught. That is very clear to me. It's simple to understand. It's very precise. And it refutes the theological position of the premillennialist. So if I, if I were a premillennialist reading these texts, I would have to question my, my own theology and why I believe that particular position and why I embrace it based on this. Because you cannot dismiss these teachings. And they are very, very clear. And that's why I chose to give you texts that are simple texts and they don't involve um, a heavy amount of symbolic language. Yes, Jesus used parables, but they're just illustrations. And they're simple illustrations that can be easily understood. And he explains in, in each case what um, the, the, the parable means. So this shows that there's one resurrection. These parables show that the, the, the righteous and the unrighteous are separated at the end of the world. This tells me that when Christ comes, that's, that's when the separation is going to be made. And there is there, there's no teaching that indicates that there is going to be a rapture which takes Christians away to have their own judgment. And then there's a separate great white throne judgment for the unsaved. That is not the theology that comes from Jesus' teaching. And, and I, I cannot um, go against what Jesus is teaching because in both of these parables, he is suggesting that the righteous and the unrighteous appear at the judgment seat of Christ. There's a separation. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And the separation takes place. And the righteous receive their reward. And the unrighteous go in to everlasting punishment. Uh, Rev. Pastor yes, John so, has a question. Pastor John yes. has a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Reverend Jackman, so does this also say that the kingdom is already established? If he's coming back at the end of the world to do a separation in the kingdom, yes. to me it would mean that the kingdom is already in existence. Yes. Would you say that is a free analysis? Yes. That, and that is our theology. And that's one of the things I mentioned that we will also discuss because they have a different position on that. You see, like the Jews, they were, they were looking for a, a physical kingdom. That's why they rejected Christ. They didn't understand that the kingdom was a spiritual kingdom and that, and that we become subjects of the kingdom and Christ is our Lord and we reign with him in, in a spiritual sense and that is the teaching of the, of, the, of the New Testament. But the Jews rejected Christ because they were looking for him to come and, and overthrow the Romans and establish a physical kingdom. And, and that's why Jesus says to them, you can't look and point to where my kingdom is. It's not a physical place. It's not a locality. You can't say low here or low there. The kingdom of God is within you. 
So they, 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 they say the kingdom of God is among you. You see, they, they change things to suit their particular perspective. You can't do that with the word. You see, the kingdom of God is within you. So it's a spiritual experience. And, and we are all part of the kingdom of God right now. Yes, there's going to be an eternal kingdom, which is in the future, which we will all inherit as the final reward. But we are already part of a kingdom. And that's why the, the, I drew the reference to you and pointed out clearly that Jesus says he will, he will pull all out of his kingdom that are fame. So it means that the kingdom is already in existence. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's a reality. But they're looking for a physical entity. And because this, their argument was that like, like the position of the Jews, it was not established in a physical way that Jesus is going to come back now to set up this physical kingdom where he's going to reign on a throne in Jerusalem because he never did it. He's, he has to come back to fulfill that promise. I don't know if they believe he made that promise, but I don't think that the scriptures indicate he made that promise, but they believe that that's what the millennium is all about. So that's their theological perspective, but you are right. We are part of the kingdom of God. And if you watch, see that, and you will watch the teachings in the New Testament, and we will look at that when we come to the kingdom of God and see that we are spark, we are part of a spiritual kingdom. Any other questions? All right, I will go to one other passage, which should be the final passage. Are we going to take this from? Yes. Oh, hi, yes, I'm um, Reverend I'm Jackman. Yes, sir. Um, how would we explain, you know, Revelation chapter 9, about a new heaven and a new earth? Well, how would you explain what the new earth would be for? What is the reason of God making a new earth? Well, as I, as I indicated, I, I don't want to pick up on that one now because we will get to that. That is part of, of the whole theology of, of the end time events and what will happen at the very, very end. And I had I thought, thrown that question out. Is it going to be the earth restored? Because there, there, there is a school of thought that the earth was cursed because of sin. And, and it lost its original beauty and intent that God had for it, for mankind. And so there's a school of thought that believes that, that when the Bible mentions that all things will be restored, they are saying that all things will be restored to what they should have originally been. And that the earth, therefore, will be restored to its Edenic beauty and that people will live on earth. Now, the, the Jehovah's believe that only 144,000 will go to heaven. The rest of the people will remain on the earth. So Jehovah's believe that position. But there, there are some evangelical um, theologians that believe that the earth will be restored. So we have to understand the concept of new heaven and new earth. Does, does, it, does it mean is that it's, it's a new brand or a brand new? In, in other words, is, is it an old earth restored and made new, or is it a completely different earth? Remember, John said he saw, he saw a new heaven and a new earth coming down, coming down. So the question is, is it what Jesus made reference to when he said, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. So if Jesus is going to prepare a place for us, the question is then, is this earth going to be restored? Because then what is Jesus preparing? What did he mean when he said he's going to prepare a place for us? What did John see when he, in his vision when he saw a new heaven and a new earth coming down? And what did Peter mean when he said that this earth and the elements and the works and all that they're in will, will melt the fervent heat? It is reserved for judgment. So he's saying that this, this earth is also going to be judged because it, it, it had most of it been in its sinful condition and that it will be replaced by a new heaven and a new earth so we will discuss that but that that is the, is the position the question is is it a new heaven a new earth meaning a completely new heaven and earth uh like, reverend like, jackman yes i think um persons might be getting confused with the end of the world and the end of the age, yes. or the end of the system. 
So yeah. the, the brother has a good point there when he asked about the new heaven and new earth. Because right. a lot of people believe that the earth will be totally destroyed. And, right. and they, 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 they get confused in their minds about if about the, the destruction of the earth or the end of the age, the end of the present system. So I think we we um or I, we I, I would also I would I would also explain, I would also explain that. Yeah, I will also explain that because what that what causes a whole lot of debate too. Because it's like when we say the end of the world, the premiers come and say no, it's the end of the age. But we will look, we will look at the at, again at the teaching of the Bible and realize that you only see two things being mentioned very often in the world. This world and the world to come. This world mm -hmm. and the world to come. So when we talk about the end of the age, what do we mean? And when we talk about the end of the world, what do we mean? Because as I said, those, those are terms that, that people interject and sometimes call the confusion because they say the end of the age means the end of a dispensation and not necessarily the end of the world. So when Jesus says it's the end of the world, what does it mean? Because to me, it can't be just the end of a dispensation because Jesus statement there clear that the end of the world meant judgment. So it can't be the end of a dispensation. It's the end of everything. It's the end of the world. So we have to clarify those, but I won't do that tonight, but that will come up in the, in the discussion. I, have, I will explain those, the end of the world and the end of the age to make sure that people are clear in their minds that we don't get confused and, and because the Bible is very, very clear on what it means. And we have to be very clear too, because then people try to confuse us with those terminologies, which, which they very often interject, support um, their particular view. So right. I guess give you one passage which I said it will give. Yes, another question. Yeah, you have two questions coming in. Someone is asking okay. you to separate the wheat and the tears, and the believers being caught up, and they're asking you which one you think comes first. <laughs> and um, so the the whole account with this, the wheat and the tears. Um, and the believers being caught up. So they're asking for an explanation. And then the second one is, do we inherit the kingdom here now or at the end of time if the kingdom is within us? Well, well again, that, that is the kingdom teaching. So that is going to take some explanation. So we can't go into that now. But if, if you are part of a kingdom, you have the inheritance of the saints of the kingdom. And the Bible teaches, teaches you that. You, you inherit all that is associated with that spiritual kingdom. So you, you are already a, mm -hmm. an individual as a Christian inheriting certain things that are associated with the kingdom of God. Yes, you are going to have a final inheritance, which is everlasting life in, in a heavenly um, kingdom, which Christ has gone to prepare. But again, as I said, the debate is, whether it's away from here or that's here we store. All right. Now again, the, the order of the resurrection, as I as I indicated before, is just a matter of sequence, not not in terms of like a time chronology. So when I say the dead in Christ shall rise first, it means before we are moved from here, wherever we are going with the Lord, in, in our in our final. Um, reward that the dead in Christ shall rise first, meaning that we will not go along and leave them. The reward is for all Christians, and the dead will be resurrected. The tears and the weekly separation is a separation in time. And how long will it take? Jesus said the hour is coming. Do we think that judgment is going to take years and years and years? That we be what is our concept? Are we thinking that we we stand up in a line being judged by God? Um, for your deeds, millions and millions of people. Listen, it, it, the, the concept of that isn't really uh, pertaining to, the, to the, the God that we serve, who, who, can, who can do things in, in, in an hour, in a moment. So, so don't, don't let us get um, you know, too carried away by, by, by time or chronology or sequencing. All this is going to take place. It means, of course, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we shall all be changed. We shall all be changed in a moment and twinkle of light. So a lot of things will take place in a very short space of time. And that's how we believe that the, 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 um, the separation will take place. And, and then we are we are taken away. 
to be with Christ and the unrighteous go in um, to, to their judgment. I just want to leave one passage with you. Somebody else have another question? From Revelation chapter 20. This is, this is the ending of, of the, the, the book of mystery. Revelation 20, 12. And I saw the day, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. The dead were judged. I saw small and great. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their work. And verse 15 said, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Separation. The book and books. And an indication that there is the book of life and there's the, the book for those who are not. You see, this is, this. Remember, remember, this is symbolic language here. Because I don't believe that God has a book. God doesn't, God doesn't need a book to record anything in it. So this is just symbolic language being used here. As we indicated already, Revelation is full of symbolism. But again, it shows a judgment that takes place where all the dead, everybody that was dead will be resurrected and judgment takes place. Small and great stand before God and those found not written in the book of life. So obviously the book of life would have got to pertain to those who are, are Christian and the those found not written in that book are the ones who are, are not righteous. And there's a separation. And notice when it comes in Revelation at the end. So we're going to stop there at that point. You still have two minutes in case anybody uh, wants to ask any question. And next week, now don't miss this one. We're going to look at um, Matthew chapter 24 in, in great detail to see the concept of this tribulation, what it actually refers to, and see the, the two different areas in which I say the book is divided into. The, the, the first part referring to the destruction of Jerusalem, and the other part referring to the coming of Christ, and see why we can have that conclusion and what are the differences that are identified in them. And, and why, why the tribulationists have this view of a great tribulation that Christians are, are being. Um, take us from. Is it a great tribulation to come, or is this tribulation one that has already happened? That's what we'll be examining in, as we look at Matthew chapter 24 in greater detail. Rev, I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this one um, right now. But let me hear it. Let me hear it. There's a question, what is the difference between hell and the lake of fire? What is the difference between hell and the lake of fire? I think it may be one in the same place just by given by different descriptions. Because we, we, can, we can see different descriptions given in, in the word for, for the lake of hell. Fire brings stone, lake of fire. And it might be just referring to one of the same place. And again, the debate on that is, is it a literal um, place of fire and brimstone? Um, is it the lake of fur, or are these just symbols used to represent a place of torment? A place of torment. So that is what we would also um, dialogue about. See, but again, that will be connected to the final, the final sentencing. Where, where do we spend eternity? And, and what is the condition of that state that we are going to be in in eternity? Because there are also views on that. The, the, the Adventist perspective that we will not be in hell for eternity. We'll be in heaven for eternity, but not in hell for eternity. That, that, that hell will have an end to it. So those are concepts that we will discuss. The, the nature of hell, what condition we're expecting, or whether it's eternal or not. So, so that, that will be answered later on.
All right, so if there are no more questions, I just want to thank you for being in our study session tonight. I'm looking forward very much to seeing you next week. That's going to be a very interesting one because we're going to connect that to history and see some of the things that were at, that had actually happened at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. And we're also going to look at the, the, the prophecy that Jesus made and see how accurate those statements that Jesus made and they pertained to that time and not necessarily to our time as we have all been thinking or a lot of us have been thinking. So that will come next week. Don't miss it. God bless you and thank you for being in tonight's session. All right.